or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Um, and thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Cheryl. I'm head of uh, I'm head of outreach at Inside Uni, and I'm going to be your chair for today. Inside Uni is a nonprofit student-led project aiming to make Oxford and Cambridge applications more accessible. So we crowdsource application advice from current students, uh, which you can find for free on our website, insideuni.org, and we've put this link in the description box below too. Today's Q&A on applying to Oxford from Asian countries continues our international undergraduates live Q&A series. We came up with a series as we realized that the student experience, whether this is about the application process or general student life, um, can be quite mysteri mysterious, especially from an international student's point of view. And so we're hoping that you'll get a chance to have your questions answered by some of our lovely panel today. Um, we have some pre-submitted questions, but we'll also be taking live ones. So please feel free to use the YouTube live chat function to introduce yourself and say which country you're from and what subject you're interested in. And now I will uh, hand it over to a panelist to introduce themselves and we'll start with Harry. Uh, hi, my name is Harry. I'm from South Korea. Uh, I did the IB at an international school in Hong Kong. Um, I study physics at the University of Oxford. Hi, my name is Millie and I'm from Japan. Um, I studied experimental psychology at Oxford and before university, I attended an international school in Japan and took the IB. Hi, my name is Harry. I'm from Shanghai, China, and I took the A-level here in the UK because I did the sixth form here in Bedford. I'm a mathematician in Oxford. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Jia Yu. So I did HSPS in Cambridge, specifically I did politics and social anthropology. Um, before university, I studied high school JC in Singapore, so I took the Singapore A-levels. Hi everyone, um, I'm Sanjan, um, I'm from India. I did the CBSE Education Board in Bangalore. Um, I'm currently a fourth year engineering student at Cambridge. And hi, um, I'm Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, hi, I'm Fly. Um, I did the A levels at an international school in Thailand before, and I've just graduated from Cambridge with an architecture degree. And now it's my turn to speak. I'm, I'm very sorry, Fly. Um, just to say that I did the IBDP at an international school in Hong Kong as well, so I will be on hand to answer any questions about DP or Hong Kong. Um, and to start off this Q&A, we'll hear from some of our panelists about why they chose to uh, apply to Oxbridge. And let's start with Jiayu. Um, so for me, I chose to apply to Oxbridge because Oxbridge has a reputation for being very academia focused um, and that re their reputation is kind of accurate. So I really wanted to get some of um, the academia, the expertise that you find in Oxbridge colleges. Um, specifically, I chose Cambridge over Oxford because um, I was looking at HSPS versus PPE. And I can elaborate a bit more about the differences if anyone's interested in that. Um, but specifically, HSPS is a lot more qualitative and the selection of subjects was something that I wanted to do a bit more. So that's why I chose Cambridge over Oxford. Yeah. Um, sorry, I think Harry now also wants to answer this question. Yeah, um, I chose Oxford because um, it has like a slightly lower standard for admissions for mathematics than Cambridge, but they have got like both of the, both of them have got like a great reputation. But for me, it was like my remarks didn't come through for like an A star in mathematics in year 12, but but at last it came out as an A star. So I, in the middle, I need to decide where to apply for Oxford or Cambridge. So I chose a safer choice, which is Oxford. But like, mm, I, <clears throat> I went for Oxford and Cambridge because like in my school before I was like one of the top mathematicians in our school and uh, my teacher thinks I have the, ability or potential to go for it and also my school provides me a lot of um, mock interviews and like sessions to help me go through the written admissions test and help me with my personal statement a lot so I think also that is a very key point for us to work hard towards Oxford and Cambridge so and I, I mean like it's not for everyone but 
we need to know like whether we have a at least have a chance to go for it or not. So that's why I chose for Oxford and Cambridge, I think. Um, for me, the reason, so firstly, the reason why I applied to um, UK universities was because I was quite set on wanting to study psychology at university. And um, I wanted to study it from first year, which is why I chose UK. And the reason why I chose Oxford was because of its particular um, subject. So it's called experimental psychology. And it's a lot more um, scientific and it focuses more on like the research side and kind of um, basically the experimental side. And that was what I was interested in. So um, that's why I chose Oxford um, as a place that, to study experimental psychology. Um, thank you to our panelists. Um, so now we're going to move on to our pre-submitted questions, um, but we'll also be taking live ones. So please ask away in the YouTube live chat. Um, we've got a few country specific questions um, about English uh, test requirements or specific grades. Um, for those, we recommend that you visit the university's website um, because we applied a few years ago. So uh, details might have changed since then, um, but do check the university's website for the mo uh, most updated information. And so now I'll pass it back to Harry to start with our first pre-submitted question. So the question is, as an Asian student at Oxford, are there any clubs and societies that help the transition and process of fitting in? So there is like, for me, I'm a Chinese here. So there is like a society called the Oxford, um, it's a, like a Chinese society for the students in Oxford and like, it's similar to the like the college family situations in the college. We also have like college parents in the Chinese society, and like um, they they have people to organize different like social activities. And we also we also have like a really massive scene competition going on. And like <clears throat> whenever I go to these kind of activities, I can also meet other students who's also from China studying in Oxford and I think it's really good help for our Chinese to fit in in Oxford but I I don't know other societies about like other Asian countries though so I can only help with that I think. Yeah so I'm also from Oxford and then there's also a Japan society that um, I went to a lot and there um, I met a lot of like Japanese students from very different backgrounds and also um, non-Japanese students who are interested in Japanese culture. And I thought that it was a really um, like friendly place to get to know other people and also um, just to talk to other people who have similar interests as you. But other than the um, country specific societies, I think um, I didn't personally feel um, that it was too difficult to fit in. There's, like so many different societies, such as relating to music or sports and arts. Um, and so you can find any society um, that matches your interests. So I think that um, joining so, um, many different societies that you would enjoy is really a good place to find friends and just um, have lots of fun at university. Um, so the next live question um, that we have is, could you tell us more about the COPA and what is expected in the personal statement? So the COPA is a Cambridge specific submission uh, and it's been quite some time since I did my submission. So things might have changed around a little bit, um, but essentially the COPA is just an additional kind of like, most of it's administrative. So there's not that much that you need to worry about, prepare about. Um, there is a little bit of a personal statement section. So I remember in, when I did my COPA, my personal statement for the COPA was a little bit more information about why I specifically wanted to go to Cambridge. I think I wrote a little bit about um, the specific college that I was applying to. What was it about the college that I really liked? Um, but at the same time, I would say like, 
um, my personal experience is that the COPA was not really as important as the rest of my UCAS application. So when I was um, doing my Cambridge interviews, for example, the only thing that they really referred to was my personal statement for the UCAS application. Um, and the stuff that I wrote in COPA didn't really come up during the interview process. So that was my experience from my outside apply to Cambridge. Um, could you share your personal interview experience, what you did to prepare, how you found the questions, what it challenging to vocalize your thoughts at interview, and do you have any recommendations if anyone has a problem? So for my interview, um, because I did because I did architecture, I had to do an exam before the interview. So that was basically a written question and also a sketching kind of practice. Um, and afterwards, I had two interviews. So one was more general, and the other one was very more subject focused, where I talked about my portfolio that I had to prepare. Um, I think um, during the interview, it wasn't that as tense as I thought it was going to be. It was actually quite relaxed. Um, I had the interview with kind of um, a tutor at the college and also my director of studies. And yeah, it was a very relaxed atmosphere and kind of the questions for the more subject specific one was other more kind of difficult and more challenging. Um, but in the end, it's, they're not really interested in like, in my opinion, they're not really interested in what your answer is, but more of how you approach the answer and answer. Um, if you have a problem, I think, um, you can, oh, sorry, um, so they would give you kind of a list of um, numbers you can call and there's a lot of um, other college students who are staff or they're there to help you during your kind of interview experience. So there's numbers you can call, there's people you can go to. I actually got lost during my interview and a lot of students were running around looking for me, but it went well, so I say don't worry about it. Hi, um, I'm also for the same question. So I've, before my interview, uh, which is uh, maths. So I also did like a written test before the interview. So it, it, it was quite hard. So I need to practice it like the past papers a lot. And during the interview, I came here to Jesus College. So there, it was like really, there were like really friendly people and student helpers to help me settle in like to find my rooms and help me find my name tag and whatever and like <clears throat> I had like four interviews in total three in the college I applied for which is Jesus and one in another college so the tutors interviewed me so there were like three main tutors for like each of the se se uh, sections in maths and the questions were quite challenging at last but they will give me some like easy questions to get me start off so um it was kind of challenging to um uh, vocalize my thoughts because sometimes if i get stuck the a really bad thing is to just keep silence i need to like tell the tutor whatever is in my mind so that he can help me and hint me and the uh, good thing is whenever I made a mistake in my interview um, the tutor would just tell me when I made a mistake to like keep me right on track and I think uh, what I recommend for people to prepare for the interviews is just um, if at their school they the teacher provide them with mock interviews it's like the best but if they don't have that opportunity they can just speak to a mirror and whatever they do like written questions they can try to speak it out loud in english and then sometimes they can also record themselves saying these questions and try to listen to it again and then try to improve their like vocalization of what they write down so yeah i think that's it okay the next question we have from jet green and he says i'm thinking of applying to Oxford PPE, are there any tips for studying for the TSA? So the TSA is the thinking skills assessment. And so it's a type of written test that um, 
some subjects take before their um, interview. So I took the TSA and for my TSA, there were two parts. So the first part was a multiple choice um, thing. And I think it involved um, questions on things like verbal reasoning and like mathematical reasoning. And the second part was a essay question, um, which I think was around 30 minutes. And um, for studying or like preparing for the TSA, so to be honest, I didn't have that much time to prepare for it because I was quite busy with the IB. But what I did was I went to the website and I think the Oxford website links to like the official TSA website. And that has a lot of um, like example papers. I think they were past papers. And so I did a few of those to kind of get a feel for um, what the questions were going to be like. But yeah, to be honest, I didn't do too many of the papers. I think I did about like two to three past papers. So yeah, that's what I did. Um, so the next question is, what is the social life and school work stress level like in Oxbridge? Um, based on my personal experience and my friends around me, I guess um, the social life is quite vibrant at, at Oxford. Um, the college system really does make it easy for you um, to make friends um, since you really do spend a lot of time with the uh, hundred or so people in your college um, through college organized social events or college libraries and cafeterias and stuff like that. Um, there are also a lot of extracurricular societies um, or clubs that you can easily get involved in. Uh, in terms of the workload, it is quite hefty. Um, and for me personally, I definitely did have to work a bit harder than I did in high school. But that's not to say it's like difficult to maintain a healthy work-life balance. Um, there's always time to go out with your friends, uh, exercise or do whatever hobbies. Uh, you may have. Um, I joined the uh, Oxford Surf Society uh, last year and even during term time with all the work I still was able to shift my schedule around and uh, go on a weekend surf trip to Cornwall uh, which is a, a city in the UK um, with the surf club so it's quite um, well balanced between the social and school uh, work in your time there. Most of what Harry said also applies to Cambridge. Um, there's a lot of analogy in terms of the college system and they are all there to help you out. Um, just a personal uh, experience. So for me, I think I quite distinctly remember that my maximum stress level was in second year when I was also trying to organize a charity event while also trying to finish work for the degree. Um, and at that point, things did start get uh, things did start to get a bit out of hand. Um, I started falling back on work. But the good thing is there is almost always someone you can talk to. Um, at college, you have a lot of um, people involved um, in the welfare division, and they're always there to look out for you. And um, so what I personally did, I contacted one of my college um, welfare reps, um, just sort of explained the matter to her. Um, and she sort of related back to my academic tutors. Um, just so that everyone is fully aware of what's happening. Um, so the next question that we have over here is a live question from Camilla Tang. Um, we're combining it with another live question from Young Universe because both are about HSPS. Um, so from Camilla, hello, can I ask about the difference between HSPS and PPE? Um, and from Young Eurus, I'm really interested in, HF, uh, in Cambridge HSPS course. Could you give us some advice on the personal statement? Um, so I'll talk about HSPS and PPE first. The first thing is that um, you need to understand that the main subjects that make up HSPS and PPE are actually quite different. So for HSPS, the three main subjects are politics and international relations, that's one. Um, the second one is sociology, and the last one is social anthropology. For PPE, it's in the name, it's philosophy, politics, and economics. So if you look at just uh, what I described earlier, the only thing that HSPS and PPE share is actually politics. So for instance, if you want to do sociology or social anthropology, you can only do that through HSPS. If you want to do economics, you can only do that through PPE. Um, and that's actually quite a substantial difference, mainly because uh, for one, HSPS is a lot more qualitative than PPE. Um, because we do sociology, anthropology, and even when we do politics at IR, the focus is very much on reading texts. Um, so it's a very qualitative, very text-based course. 
Um, whereas for my friends who do PPE, especially if you're doing the economics track, you actually end up doing things that are more statistical. You end up doing a bit more math. You barely see kind of like any math in HSBS um, as compared to PPE. Um, so it's worth thinking about that difference. Um, in terms of the advice on the personal statement, I would say um, for me, I personally came from a background where I didn't really formally do any kind of like politics or astrology back in high school because those weren't subjects that's offered in Singapore. Um, but the good thing about something like HSPS and PPE for that matter is that it's kind of everywhere, right? So you don't need to kind of do sociology in order for you to appreciate that there are social issues. You don't need to do politics in order for you to be involved and to be concerned about politics in your country. So because it's a personal statement, I would say really just draw from the experiences that you personally have in school. So for me, um, my kind of segue into my personal statement was I wound up talking a lot more about um, some of the extracurriculars that I did that were related to kind of like politics. What does it mean to see politics in every day? Um, I also talked a little bit about the things that I learned in history because um, there, are re there are really clear overlaps in terms of history and politics and things like that. So just draw on the experiences that you have, draw on the things you did in school which you enjoyed. And I think that would be a very good place for you to start your personal statement. Yeah. Great. Um, the next question. Uh, did any of you apply from outside of the UK and not study A-level at a British sixth form college? If so, what do you think is the difference between your application and that of others? So I studied the CBSE Education Board in India, which is not an internationally recognized board. Most of the application is the same. So you have the same deadline. Uh, you need to submit the same documents. Um, for me, particularly, what was different was uh, my school didn't have as, I think, as many internal exams um, as you would have in the UK. So, and, and I also sort of made the decision to apply to Cambridge a bit late. So I didn't have much choice in trying to improve my school grades at that point. Um, so, so I'd say if, if you are applying, then um, do sort of keep a track of what internal exams you have at school. Um, and the, the second thing that I think helped me was if you're not from an internationally recognized board, it, it may be useful to take some internationally recognized exams. So for me particularly, I took the SAT subject test and the advanced placements. Both of them are actually US application specific, um, but, but at least for STEM subjects, um, for engineering in particular, um, Cambridge does recognize those as, as valid scores that can add to your application. So for me, I studied the IB in an international school in Japan. And um, as Sanjan already said, I think the pro application process is um, not too different from those in the UK. So you have to do the UCAS, um, you do the written tests, um, the interview. But um, after that, if you do get a conditional offer, you have to meet your um, requirements. So A-levels in the UK. And for me, it was IB scores. And I think that was the most different because in um, A-levels, you need to get um, the three papers, whatever scores you need to get on those. But for IB, when I applied anyway, um, you had to get the three scores in the higher level classes that you were taking. And they also had a requirement for the um, total, like out of 45 um, requirement. Um, this is not just for Oxford, but for most um, British universities as well. And so, um, yeah, there was that difference. And I don't know whether one is easier or not, obviously, because it's completely different experiences. But I found having like the total um, requirement a bit of a challenge since you do have to do well in all six of your subjects. Um, so from Jet Green, would you recommend doing an open admittance for Oxford or applying to a specific college? And from Ape, what factors did you take into account when choosing a college to apply to? So um, I think um, it's not that different, the college system in Oxford and Cambridge. So for me, um, I've, I have chosen to apply to St. John's College. And that was because um, I looked at the college and obviously like the college is really beautiful. And I think that is quite important for me because I'm an architecture student. Um, also, I think another good thing to look at is kind of um, 
other colleges do different kind of fundings and scholarships. So I was able to get a lot of funding for my course and for course materials. Also um, looking at kind of the director of studies, is that someone who you would work kind of quite closely with depending on your subject. So if their expertise is in something that you want to pursue in future, I think it's useful to kind of look at that. Um, but yeah, I think um, it's, I think I would recommend kind of go choosing a college because if um, you end up not being a good fit for that college, they would put you in a pool where you will be kind of maybe picked up by another college in future anyways. Um, yeah. And I'll just add something in here quite quickly. Um, we, we know that, you know, colleges aren't necessarily quite well known outside of the Oxford model, especially in the UK. Um, I think only Durham is the other university, I think, who has colleges, but someone, please feel free to uh, correct me on this. Um, a college, you know, is basically where you live and like it's your preliminary so social circle. So um, one thing to emphasize here is that regardless of which college you apply to, the type of teaching, the quality of teaching um, is going to be the same if you, because you know they're all constituents of the same uh, university um, and like Ply mentioned there are lots of factors uh, to consider when you're applying to your college um, in Ply's case of course she uh, values the architectural beauty of the college um, and just making sure that it looks nice which is a factor uh, definitely something worth thinking about also some distinctions are like old colleges versus new colleges um, and uh, I, I want to bring also bring up fin uh, finances here because it is true that some colleges are wealthier than others and will be in a better position to provide uh, financial funding for like, depending on what you need basically. So I think that's something also uh, worth kind of looking into. Um, and um, also once again, everything, like all the factors that you consider um, when choosing a college, um, make sure that you consider multiple factors together and not just the one because, you know, factors can change. Um, for example, academics can move from one college to another. Um, so don't apply for a college just because the academic you want to work with is at that college because, you know, they might not be there when you actually come to apply. Um, and also, I think I, I just want to draw upon, um, I think, Tamana's question here about whether there is a best college in Cambridge or Oxford. Um, because it's such a subjective decision and there's so many factors to take in, um, there isn't a best college um, and certainly not one that we can re recommend you anyway, but we do suggest that you do do your research and, ha and have a look basically at all the different colleges and see what they have to offer. So this is a live question from Vidit Godham. How many students do you see from your region in your college and class? So um, I think uh, for me, Chinese, it's a really massive group of people in Oxford. In my year in, for mathematics in Jesus College, uh, they are, there were like eight mathematicians and four of them are Chinese. So I think uh, for the application from uh, China or some Asian countries, I think for um, all the unis in at the UK, they will like cut down a little bit of the number for the international students to prioritize their nationals first. But, but and like the a, a Chinese group of mathematicians is also really competitive. And like they, I, I'm not, I don't mean like competitive, they, they are like really of a high, high standard. So in interviews, we really tend to like, sometimes we tend to do well and, but there are also like, circumstances they need to balance the male and female students so so there are like four female and four male or like three females and five males in my year group but so I I think like in my department when I go to lectures there are like quite a number of like Asian students so I don't I don't think they are like discriminized and I, I don't think they are like a, a little a, a few of them so I think um, quite a number of students from my region can get into Oxford as well so be confident all right thanks 
Um, so the next question is a live question from David Wet. Uh, from David Wet. Um, how did having your tutorials online compare with having them face to face? Um, I just want to clarify here that for anyone who's kind of following the news of what Cambridge is doing, it's actually not entirely clear um, what the university plans to do with the next reopening. So it's worth just paying attention to any official announcements that might come up. I think Cambridge has said that they are committed to having everyone physically back on campus, but um, the pandemic is kind of a really fast moving situation. So that could actually change from time to time. Um, for us, what happened to, what I experienced was basically it was just our last term. So in Cambridge, you have three terms. So it was just the last term, um, which I had to do virtually as a result of the pandemic. Um, I would say that because I do HSPS and it's a humanities subject. So usually my tutorials involve me submitting an essay and then we'll discuss the essay with my supervisor and with my supervisor, supervision partners. So um, the impact of having them move online is actually not that big because we just essentially took the same conversation that we will be having um, in a room online. So that was actually, in terms of the tutorials specifically, that was actually all right. And it was, I think, less disruptive than I imagine it would be. Um, but at the same time, like there is a lack of a physical element. It's just kind of like um, sometimes, for example, after a lecture, I think it does make a difference whether the lecture is pre-recorded and whether you can just go up to a lecture and just follow up with a question immediately. Um, I think it's something that you have to, um, we all have to adapt to. And the great thing that I experienced was, I think the part of the strengths of the Cambridge tutorial system is that you have professors and you have supervisors who are really invested in giving you a good education. And that definitely extends to moving everything online as well. So I have supervisors who are trying to accommodate different time zones and um, they appreciate kind of the difficulties that you are facing as well when you're doing it online. Um, so they've tried to make as many accommodations as possible. Um, but all that being said, I do appreciate that it will probably be a lot harder for people who are doing STEM subjects or subjects which require you to perform some kind of experiments um, or labs. So yeah, um, I can only share from the experience of a humanities student. Sorry, I think, uh, Harry, Harry, do you want to answer the next question, <laughs> the next live question? Sorry, sorry. Um, this question is asked by Shreya Gautam. Sorry, sorry if I'm slaughtering that pronunciation. Um, and how much weightage is given to extracurricular activities while admissions at Oxford or Cambridge? Um, from what I've heard from my counselors from back in high school or um, as well as from my personal admissions experience. Um, Oxbridge admissions doesn't really take into account extracurriculars that heavily, um, especially if it doesn't relate to the major you're applying for. Um, but I do remember during one of my interviews for physics, um, I was asked about an experiment that I found particularly memorable or influential. Um, and I answered by talking about a physics paper I wrote for an academic conference I attended. Um, so you can always briefly mention the extracurriculars you have been involved in during the interview. Um, but overall, I do believe your pre-admissions test and your interview is the most heavily weighted factor in your admissions process at Oxbridge. Um, to add to that, actually, um, in the COPA form, we're allowed to put in kind of supplementary things that we did that would add to our application. So I've put in that I've done Model United Nations, which is very far from architecture. Um, and actually, my interviewer asked me specifically about Model United Nations and how they thought that this would help me in my course as an architecture student. So kind of in that moment during the interview, I managed to kind of connect um, being representing Italy in Model United Nations to um, kind of understanding the client when you're working as an architect. And um, my director of studies told me afterwards that he was not expecting kind of that correlation, but it really strengthened kind of my application. So I think it's always good to um, add random things that you might not think directly relates to your application into your application.
So this is a live question from Kara Pine. Are there more Asian students in Cambridge than in Oxford, or is it easier for Asians to get into Cambridge than Oxford? Um, for me, I'm not studying in Cambridge, so I couldn't speak for Cambridge. But in my opinion, there are like there is like a similar proportion of Asian students in Cambridge than in Oxford. So the admissions work similarly. So if you are like up for like a higher standard, you are like more likely to get in. But I don't think they would like discriminate against any Asian students or like students in other parts of the world. And if I need to answer the question for, is it easier to, for Asians to get into Cambridge and Oxford? There are like a specific, uh, specific admissions requests and uh, like requirements for Cambridge and Oxford. For, and for the courses, some of them are like really different. Like for me in maths, the, the written test for like math is also different. And then the, like the number of offers they gave out for the interviews and for the final conditional offers are also different for each course. So I don't know like which course you're applying to. So I can only tell you about maths, but I don't think like there's like a specific difference for the Asians to get into Oxford than in Cambridge. So that's only what I can say for now, I think. Yeah, and I'll just add on uh, to that. Basically, yes, there isn't a distinction necessarily between Asian, particularly Asian intake between Oxford and Cambridge. Um, what teachers are ultimately looking for is, of course, your academic ability as well as your passion for the subject. And in that case, you know, your race doesn't really um, matter. Um, it, yeah, it doesn't influence strongly on, you know, the outcome of your application. And um, yeah, so they won't see that, you know, your agent decides to, you know, either offer you a place or to not offer you a place. So again, it's your academics and your um, super supercurricular activities, as well as um, your basically your passion for the subject that will really matter in the long run. Um, the next question is a live question from Serafina Ho. Um, on average, how many hours do you spend a day studying um, outside of classes? Um, so it basically really depends on the amount of work you have in that particular week or two week stretch. Um, it also depends on the subject you're taking as well. Um, but on average for me, um, during term time, I probably spend about two to four hours a day, um, not necessarily just studying but most of the times doing like the homework assigned for my tutorials or just talking over some content with my friends who are also doing physics. Um, but sometimes when I feel like I'm very behind on the work or my understanding of a certain topic is lacking, obviously I would dedicate a bit more time studying um, during that particular uh, time period. Um, but overall, there's always time to do other stuff like going out, exercising, um, just having fun with your friends. Uh, so there's not too much uh, stress about um, spending too much time a day studying. Um, to add on to Harry, like obviously, as he said, it does really depend on the structure of your course. And so my course didn't have many contact hours, which are like um, t basically times in class. And so I might just have like one lecture a day. And so I spent more times outside of class doing like the reading for my essays. And basically like the Oxford recommendation is that we study um, like out, we study 40 hours a week, which I'm not sure everyone actually does. But for me personally, if I had an essay due, I would probably spend like um, around maybe 20 hours a week to do it. And then if I had two essays, I'll probably go um, over that and maybe do 30 to 40 hours a week but those are like very very busy weeks um, also to add to this like this was um, talking in terms of during term but I think one of the unique aspects of Oxford and I think this is the same similar for Cambridge too but please correct me if I'm wrong um, so for Oxford we have um, things called collections which are like mock exams and these come at the start of the term which means that we have to do a revision during the vacation so for example 
like during the Christmas vacation, which is about like five weeks, um, we had to do some revision. And then when we come back for term, we immediately have like a mock exam. Obviously, this doesn't really count for anything, but um, we do do have to do some studying. So I think that's um, one big difference to other universities. The next question is from QN Science. How often do you go back to your home country? And what happens with things like accommodation and storage of your stuff? So for me personally, I went back, I went back a lot in my, especially my first two years, I went back every vacation. Um, it's because term is so short, the vacations are quite long. And overall for me, it was cheaper to go back home rather than stay and like occupy a room in the UK for the vacation. Um, in terms of accommodation and storage, you've usually got two options. So first, you can have your room for the vacations. Um, at least that's what happens in most colleges. They allow you to pay, um, pay a bit. Um, they allow you to pay for those vacation weeks also at a reduced rate. Um, so you can, so at, that's good because you can keep all your stuff in your room and not worry about packing or moving them elsewhere. Um, but if you don't want to keep your room during vacation time. Um, usually colleges have a designated space for international storage, in which case you're usually allowed like a, a certain number of boxes. So you pack everything up, um, store it away there. Um, if you can talk to a friend for storing um, items in their room, that is also great. I just want to add that, um, especially for Queens, specific to applicants, specific to this year, um, they're making um, everyone keep their room during the vacations as well. And, and so uh, they will have longer periods of possible residency at a reduced rate, um, just because they don't expect the rooms to be used during the vacation time. But that might just, just be coronavirus situation related and not um, applicable for next year. Um, so a live question from John. How did the coronavirus outbreak affect your mode of study last year? So in my last term for architecture, at least, um, so there's no lectures in the Easter term for architecture. So in that respect, it did not change much. But what is quite a heavy part of architecture is we have studio periods, which is usually kind of two times a week where we meet with our um, tutors, design tutors, and have kind of presentations about our project. And because architecture is a very kind of hands-on subject where we're constantly making models using kind of the wood cutting workshop and like the laser cutter and all that. So that wasn't an option for, um, for my project this year. So everything kind of moved online. Um, we had weekly kind of tutorial meetings on Zoom. And basically my department in particular was quite lenient with this and very understanding. So we, went, we weren't expected to make any physical models. So everything kind of moved to 3D and we were all presenting online. And instead of presenting to a live kind of judge of audience, we did an online recording instead. And also um, kind of for results, um, I think my department in particular was very um, understanding towards kind of different conditions of different people. So we were asked to submit kind of a uh, document, Word document explaining our situations and what makes it kind of difficult for us to perform this year. And that was taken into account when they were kind of figuring out the grades for this year. Uh, the next question is from Guy Three Karad. Uh, question is, I want to ask if you were always a high achiever in terms of academics. Um, so while that is a very relative question, uh, I think I can say that I, I had I had good grades until the 10th grade, um, for sure. Um, however, on the onset of 11th, there, uh, my priorities did change a bit. So I was also preparing for um, examinations happening in India, and they usually tend to conflict with preparations for your school, um, which is my my grades in 11th did did drop. Um, so for my application in particular, I looked at sort of recovering those losses by writing um, the advanced placements and SAT subject tests. Um, interesting anecdote from my interview. So, um, so I applied for engineering and during my interview, my uh, current director of studies, who was my interviewer then, he sort of went through my grades and was like, okay, so I've seen you've got 
good grades until 10th, okay grades in 11th, but I see an interesting C in chemistry. What is that about? And I was sort of put on the spot there because um, I hadn't really prepared for that. Um, but I think uh, I, I just said, well, I was, I was busy preparing for these other exams and um, I, I didn't have that much interest in chemistry. So that sort of took a backseat and he was like, okay. Um, so I guess um, just give it your best. Um, if asked about anything in the interview, just, just be honest about why. Um, so the next question is by Vidit Gautam. Um, where can I play the drums in Cambridge if I'm not doing music? Um, basically, I go to Oxford, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I do believe you don't necessarily have to be studying music to get involved in the uh, university orchestra or ensembles as long as you audition for them and get accepted. And also, if you're looking for something a bit more casual, uh, there are a lot of societies that are either uni-wide or just within your college. Um, so my college at Oxford has a jazz band that is very chill. Um, we just rehearse once every week for about an hour where we just play some uh, songs and basically just have fun. Um, and basically just to summarize, uh, there are a lot of opportunities for you to get involved in musical activities, both uni and college-wide. I'll take this question as well from a perspective of having um, recently graduated from music at Cambridge. Um, there are lots of things, basically, as Harry said, there are lots of opportunities um, to get involved in the musical scene at uh, both Oxford and Cambridge, regardless of whether you're actually doing this, uh, music as a subject or not. Um, so uh, there, there are lots of genres. So there will be like musical theatre, um, jazz bands, as Harry mentioned, um, big bands, wind bands, all that kind of stuff. And the really nice aspect that I enjoy about them is that a lot of them are student led. And so you really get to like come together and just, you know, make the music that you want to make um, and then choose, you know, which venues you want to perform at. So uh, in that sense, there are lots of opportunities for you to just like kind of get your fingers into um, the music scene and just kind of experiment from there on. So this is a live question from Indigo M, intended math major, where what kind of competition experiences do you have? What are the important factors for Oxford to know your mathematical ability? So I myself uh, attended the first round of British Math Olympiad, and I did quite well in the, like, the multiple choice one, but I didn't quite did the BMO first round pretty well. But in terms of Oxbridge, they, and the, if you have like a higher grade or like a prize for the math competitions, uh, it's a plus, but you don't necessarily need, uh, need one to get into Oxbridge. Basically, um, for, if you want to do maths in Oxbridge, there's, they're like just two main parts. The first part is the written admissions test. The second part is the interview. So for the admissions test, you can always uh, find past papers and like the mark schemes online to practice it. And like for the interviews, as I said before, you just need to like practice yourself and also arranging some mock interviews with teachers to help you with interviews is also important. And also in terms of the personal statement, it's, it's really useful to get like a really good personal statement to help you get the interview. And for the competitions, I, I, I mean, it's not really that necessary, but it's good to have like a higher standard in competitions because it's also like helps you practice a lot of harder questions that may like you may get those kind of competition style questions in interviews anyway. So you need to have like a good reaction to those kind of questions. So, yeah, that's it. Okay, the next question was from Justina Yongjie Cho. Um, the question is, are volunteer experiences or additional reading more important for applying to Oxbridge for psychology? So I'm assuming that she means volunteer experiences relevant to psychology. And for me personally, so I studied psychology at higher level in IB. Um, and I also did the extended essay, which is like a 4,000 word essay that everyone has to do in IB. Um, and that was on like a topic in psychology. And so, but other than that, I didn't really have much experience or additional like things I did surrounding psychology. 
So I don't think it's particularly necessary. Um, but the most important part is when writing your personal statement, you're going to have to explain why you want to study psychology. And so if um, your volunteer experience or if your additional reading adds to that, then that would be um, definitely useful. But other than that, I think it's more about how you perform in the written test and how you perform in the interview, which is like an academic interview um, that is important for getting into Oxbridge. Uh, the next question is a combination of two, actually. From Jeremy Tan, we have, to any STEM subject majors, were there any projects that you mentioned in your personal statement? Did you read any additional material? And from Jade Tong, we have, for a STEM personal statement, how much technical detail about the subject would you recommend including? Um, to answer the first part about the projects, uh, so personally, I was very interested in robotics at the high school level. Um, I, I took a fairly uh, simple Arduino course um, for a few weeks. And um, what I learned from there and what I built during that course actually formed the, the bulk, oh, not the bulk, but it's, it, was the, it, was the, uh, it was the introduction to my personal statement. Um, I was sort of saying, okay, I was very interested in, in robotics. Um, these are the type of projects that um, I have done. And these are the projects that I would like to do further on. Um, for how much technical detail about the subject to include, uh, I would say not that much unless you're quite ready to talk about it. So personally, while I did use transistors at a very, um, very simple level during the robotics course, um, I was asked about it in my interviews. And I think my interviewer realized that I hadn't, well, I, I didn't know as much as he was expecting me to know while I did say it on a personal statement. Um, so if you, if you do say something technical on your personal statement, um, just be ready to answer to what extent you know about it. Um, and it's also good to have an answer ready about um, how much further you'd like to learn. Um, the next question we have is one from Shreya Galtam. Since Oxford and Cambridge are more focused on academic scores during admissions mostly, what kind of questions are asked during interviews? Um, are they mostly academic related or out of the box questions? Um, so for my interview experience, I, I would say that they are mostly academic related questions. My understanding is that for some of the STEM subjects, you might actually have to do like a quick, there might be a few questions or um, a test that's administered to you at the interview. So what they are looking for is really your ability to kind of solve the questions that they've put for. Um, during my HSPS interview experience, it's actually quite um, interesting because some of my friends were really nervous about the interview and kind of like, um, about, about like two days before I went into my interview, my friend told me she read a grand total of like five or six academic books. And that was like, I have not read a single academic book. So I was really nervous during my interview. Um, but when I went in, what happened was my interview was actually just a lot based off my personal statement. So I think what interviewers are looking for, they're really looking to have a conversation with you about the academic subject. So in my case, it was all about, um, so if I said that I was interested in kind of like nationalism and kind of ways of civic nationalism based on my interest in history, but also just kind of the things that I saw in some of my volunteering work that I did in Singapore. Um, so it was a conversation that really opened up from there. And what's really interesting as well is um, in my personal statement, I referenced a particular text um, and as it so happened for the HSBS interviews, um, all of my other friends, they were basically asked to, they were, um, the interviewer gave them an extract from that particular text to read, and they were asked to respond to, um, based on their reading of the text. Um, but because I already mentioned that text in my personal statement, so my interviewer didn't give me like the text to read again. So she just began the conversation there. But regardless of kind of what kind of interviewer you get or what subject you are going for, just remember that it's always supposed to be kind of an academic conversation. In some ways, I think it's supposed to resemble what you would expect from supervision. So my experience during a supervision has always been like kind of, I submit this piece of return work to my supervisors and then they will tell me, they'll kind of like question me or ask me to take them through my line of, um, my line of thought. And that's really more or less what they are looking for in the interview as well. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so unfortunately we do realize that we're quite short on time and we know that there are lots of other questions that we haven't gotten around to today yet. Um, but feel free to contact, you know, college admissions tutors or the International Admissions Office. Um, and I think our moderators, Tammy and Helena, have put the links to the in the chat box. 
Um, but we'll also be sharing our social media channels at, uh, in the chat box at the end of the webinar as well. So if you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, and for now, I'm just going to sort of bring this whole webinar to a close um, by asking our panelists about the one thing they wish they had known or the one piece of advice they wish they had um, when, when they were applying as an international student from their country. And we'll start with Harry. Um, so for me as an international student, um, I actually had to fly over to Oxford to attend the interviews. Um, and at the time I thought it was like a necessary element to applying and um, getting accepted. But um, one of my friends actually, she did her interview over Skype. Um, she stayed in Hong Kong, um, but she, she was still accepted. So, and a few of my friends also at Oxford have been accepted through online interviews. So you don't really have to um, necessarily fly over to Oxford to um, attend the interviews. Uh, yeah. Mine's also about the interview, but um, for me personally, I had very little knowledge about what the interviews are going to be. So one thing I really wanted to have known was um, the presence of like Inside Uni and their um, um, testimonials about the different interviews. So I think um, if you are quite nervous about it, you should look through those. And there are also other um, videos and other organizations that do similar things. So definitely um, go look through those to get an idea about what the interview will be like. For me, I wish I had like a better grab on my personal statement as well, because um, I can, in China, I can chat with my peers and to find out which, like who of them which one of them applied to the same college as mine. So I will, I need to avoid like certain topics that are really common. So like in my personal statement, I talk about some like really common knowledge. So that's something I need to delete. So I need to like talk about more like difficult stuff in general, but the most importantly, I need to understand what I like, understand what I write in my personal statement because in the interview that professors tend to ask about the personal statement and you cannot make like silly mistakes about like whether or not you have done certain things in the in your personal statement so you shouldn't lie in your personal statement and yeah I think yeah that's my advice um, for me, I think it's really about not being afraid to ask for help if you need any. Um, so there's a lot of actually very useful online resources that's currently available. So to build on what Mindy mentioned earlier, things like Inside Uni is really, really helpful. And there's just an awful lot of goodwill for student-run access initiatives for Oxford students. So I remember when I was applying, um, there were these Tumblr pages that were run by students, which were really, really helpful. Um, specifically for me to figure out what college I wanted to apply to and also to figure out like whether it was HSPS or PPE that I want to do more. Um, and even if that information isn't already published somewhere on a blog or something, there are always a lot of people that um, you can reach out to and to ask, like feel free to drop, I think like Inside Uni, I think the team at Inside Uni will be more than happy to help you with that. But there's just a lot of online resources. So don't be afraid to like search and to ask if what you're looking for is not online. My piece of advice would be about uh, choosing your college. Um, personally, I found it very overwhelming with the amount of information because there are like, at least for Cambridge, there are 31 colleges. Each has their own style and it can be quite difficult to choose. Um, so what I did was I just didn't worry too much. I just gave an open application. I'm quite happy with my college currently, um, but I, I think I wish I had put a bit more thought into it. Um, specifically, you probably want to look at uh, distance from town center or your department, um, your class size, um, that can be either your year group size or your uh, subject group size at your college, because they are usually the um, group that you spend most time with during your degree. Um, and the third thing would be any funding or um, financial help that um, is specific to that college. Um, for me, I think during the interview, um, if you do get one, don't be afraid to take pauses. They're not going to psychoanalyze you and think you don't know what you're talking about if you take a second to really think about it. I think don't be afraid if you've given the wrong answer because like they're there to help you and they're not there to kind of 
like pick what you're doing wrong apart. Um, and what I've, I was told when I was um, going to go into my interview that was quite helpful to me to kind of ease the nervousness was um, it's a two process. You're also looking to see if Cambridge is where, it, if it's a place that would suit you. And so as much as they have to like you, you, you would like want to see if you would like to study here. Because um, I've had another interview at another university and that was not a great experience and it put me off going there. So, yeah. Yeah, and I will just add in my own two cents into this as well. Um, so definitely, um, as older panelists have mentioned, um, definitely be yourself. There's no point in trying to make yourself become the person who you think your interviewers want you to be because a you don't know if that's correct and b you know you're not being genuine and like it's just going to be harder in the long run um and also one thing i think this is pretty straightforward but just to do your research and of course you know with you being in our web uh, in our q a right now hopefully we would have helped you achieve a bit of that um but just go look at all the different resources that are out there there are lots uh, but there are certainly, you know, different types um, and they're quite all encompassing. So just have a look um, and kind of, you know, scope out the ones that you think are most applicable or beneficial for you. Well, in that case, um, that's the end of replying to Oxford from Asian countries Q&A. Um, thank you to all our panelists today for giving up their time and I hope their answers were useful. And we also want to thank the Cambridge International Admissions Office for helping us organize today's event. Um, each university will also be ho uh, hosting their own open days and admissions webinars soon, so keep an eye out for signups for those. Make sure to also visit InsideUni.org and subscribe to your YouTube channel to stay up to date with our videos. Um, that includes today's Q&A if you want to rewatch it and our future video series on interviews and personal statements. Now, a lot of what the content that we pr produce is based on what we hear from applicants and students. So if you liked uh, or enjoyed or found today's uh, Q&A useful, please give us a like and subscribe as well, um, because that lets us know what's uh, helping you and that helps us uh, make more tailored content for you. And as I mentioned earlier, there are also lots more free uh, resources on our website, so do go check that out too. In the meantime, let us know your thoughts on this Q&A or on future events that you'd like to see by getting in touch via our social media channels. Um, and I hope that Tammy and Hel Helena have linked to them in the chat box. If not, they'll be in the des description. And uh, yeah, just follow us for updates. Um, thank you very much for joining us today and we hope to see you at our future events. Bye. Okay, and we should be off.